Good morning, folks. A couple of, a couple of announcements. One is uh, M Manesh is uh, uh, can't do office hours this afternoon from 4 to 6 because he has some sort of uh, good medical excuse and uh, uh, but I'll, I'll be in lab from, from just after class until 4.30 so uh, and I can't stay later than that because I have to go home and eat and then go talk to Schuyler County about solar power. So much fun. So, um, so the lab will be open for questions from, from 1.30 or so today until 4.30. And you're of course welcome to be in there after that. Uh, a couple of people reminded me I haven't talked about how you turn in reports and the TAs and I haven't talked about this either. But what we did in 4760 last semester was straight up electronic. You submit them to a location, you get back comments electronically so no trees die. Is everybody okay with that? Yeah, because who has a printer now? So, <clears throat> so then tomorrow you will, since we haven't had a chance to talk to the, I haven't had a chance to talk to the TAs in a couple of weeks and and uh, Manesh is out of service anyway. Just send your reports to all three TAs because they love email. Um, any questions about Lab Two? I got an interesting question yesterday, which made me uh, stop and scratch my head for a while, and that is the output of your simulation is in the range of plus minus one and a little more. It can, it can actually overflow to 1.99 or so. But, but the goal is to keep it in the range of plus minus one. And <clears throat> the VGA screen is about a 480 vertical resolution. And so if you're going to see the waveform on the screen, you need to scale this thing up to something like 100 units tall. Right. So the question is, that you, given that you have a fixed point number between 1 and minus 1, how are you going to scale it? Have you, some people have already thought about this, obviously. And how did uh, you, you scale it, Sean? This is complicated <laughs> Like shifted it to the top, yeah, like so many bits, and then shifted it. So, so the 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 canonical way to do it is to say we have a a, a number in the range of plus minus one. So we could multiply by fifty and then add fifty, right? And that would shift it into the zero to a hundred range. <coughs> And to do that with fixed point means that you'd have to do a bit extend because this, the fixed point I defined overflows at 2. So to do this multiplication, you have to do a bit extend and then do some other work to, to figure out how to do it. Yes? You can change your interpretation of the fixed point and the addition? You could change the addition. Of the, and, and what I'm going to suggest is exactly that, which is, which is really what Sean said also, and that is, take the value of x1 in fixed point, so this is now fixed point, and change the way you think of it as just a big integer. In fact, it's too big to put on the screen because it has a range of, uh, if, you f if you convert this to int, it has a range of plus or minus 65,000, right? So, we want to get 65, we want to get 2 to the 16th down to maybe 2 to the 7th or so. So that should suggest that you want to do a right shift, a signed right shift, signed right shift by about 10 bits. And then add the offset you want, maybe 128 or so. Yes? So that's essentially what we did, but there was some order of operations Thing that we had a problem with. Well, because we didn't do a pure right shift, we 
just took the top ten bits first and just treated those as an end? Well, that's that's what the shift does, so yeah, that's okay. If you do it specifically by like slicing into it, like it becomes unsigned unless you slice to a signed variable. Yeah. yeah. So you need to do it in multiple lines. Yeah. Yes, that's correct. Be aware of your sign. But but this will work also, yeah. and remember that the plus operator has a higher precedence than shift. And so if you don't put in the brackets here, the, the, the uh, parentheses, you'll be shifting by 138 bits, which is a lot. So, so if, you, if you do this operation and get zero, you go back and look at the brackets and make sure you did the right thing. But I think that's about right. This might be 9 or 11. Yes? Sir, where did this come in? 11? This is coming in, to scaling the plus minus one fixed point onto the screen. Where you want something 128, 100 units high, something like that on the screen. <clears throat> so this is really a way of, of, of scaling the, the, the fixed point down to a, a smaller number. I thought I ought to, I, when I was, I was, I wrote out the steps for, that I think is necessary for, for generating a, a EBAB bus master, I realized it's a lot of steps, so I modified the Avalon bus master peripheral page to have a short list of things you need to do when you actually use a external bus Avalon uh, adapter. I mean, clearly the first thing you're going to do is to is to drag the EBAB module out onto the uh, QSYS layout. The EBAB module is in the university submenu, and under there it's on bus devices, I believe, submenu from there. And you're immediately going to want to rename it something reasonable. So there's no particular reason why it has to be just called external bus. Uh, you're going to want to so this so this is just called external master because I wasn't very creative when I did the first example. But by the time I get down to VGA bus th thing, the uh, I'm calling it bus master video. Oh, that's way more creative. So you can rename this anything you want. And that name gets carried through to the signals that appear, that we're going to talk about in a minute, the, 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 the signals which appear in Verilog. So the next thing you're going to need to do is to decide what bus slaves the EBAB can communicate with and connect the EBAB uh, bus master terminal to any slaves that it, it, it needs to write to. And in the case of this first example, which just writes to LEDs and, and the bus master, the Avalon master output from the, from the EBAB module, is wired up to the hexadecimal display and to the LEDs because that's what we want to control. So you have to you have to do that wiring by by figuring out what you actually want to control and and wiring it up. And I'll give you a, go back and do a couple of more examples on that. And then you want to export the external interface conduit connection and to do that uh, yeah and to do that you're going to you're going to double click on this field here which is the export field 
and under the EBAB, the external interface, when you double click over here, it will synthesize, it will, it will take whatever you call this and uh, append external interface to it and make it the signal names which appear in Verilog. So you need to name that and you might want to name it something reasonable. I usually use the default but you might want to name it something reasonable. Once you do that then you generate the QSYS. You need to generate the QSYS to incorporate all of your changes. Once you've done that, you've generated the QSYS successfully, then you go to the folder which includes the QPF file, which is the project description file, wherever that lives on your system. And then one level down from that is a folder called computer system, if you're using my system. And in that folder, you will find a file called computer system instd.v, which is generated by QSYS as the interface file. It is a template for the interface file. So if we open that thing up, uh, this is just horribly formatted because of wraparound. But if we go to the bottom of this mess, we'll find there's our EBAB video in external interface address which is connected to and because it was so poorly formatted I I brought it up to the top level here of the page so what's generated by QSYS is the internal <coughs> signal name of the module EBAB video in external interface address byte enable read write so on and here then is where you specify the names that you need to connect it to the outside world to the Verilog <clears throat> so you're going to get that from the inst file now <clears throat> all the examples I've given you have the computer file, the computer interface module already in them. So you don't have to re-cut and paste in every signal from that thing, which is several hundred signals. You only have to cut and paste in these seven into the module. And this is, this is the, the template that, was, that uh, came with the universal compu university computer. It's, the, it's a module of type computer system and its name is the system. And scrolling down through this thing, we get to the actual instantiation of the module. And you see, I just cut and pasted in the seven lines and then I modified the targets over here, the signals, to be what I generated in my Verilog as the, as the bus interface. And I went for shorter names because I got tired of typing them. But I tried to keep them um, a little bit uh, descriptive. So then what's going to happen is the, the bulk of the intellectual work here is to generate these signals in Verilog with the correct state machine to handle the bus. So what you need to do then is play with the read-write lines and generate addresses and generate data and read data in a state machine and that state machine is what is going to is going to read and write the signals here. And again, as an example, there's the VGA master, which the top level module has uh, uh, has the system in it with the bus master video external interface with the seven signals defined here. 
And then if we go up to the code just before that, we see that we're, we're defining all of these signals. The bus address is 31 bits, 32 bits. The video base address is 32 bits, constant. Uh, by, bus byte enable, all of the signals that we need are defined here. And then we have to write a state machine that generates the the control signals, which is what the, the following code does. And we've already been through this, so I'm not going to say it again unless people want to hear it. But this is the part that's actually hard, is getting the, is getting the state machine right. For lab two, what you're going to be doing is to connecting your solver to the EBAB and we talked about scaling amplitude but you also have to scale time and I asked for several cycles across the screen that's a little vague vague's okay in this case I don't want 50 cycles I don't want a half a cycle say five or ten cycles and you need to scale the output so that you you can do that if you just took if you just plotted every time step and let's say you chose a delta T of 2 to the minus 9 there's about 2 to the ninth times uh, steps across this there's about 2 to the ninth pixels across the screen a little more than that if you just plotted every time step you'd see one radian of the waveform if k over m is 1. So if the, if the natural frequency is 1 radian per time unit and you plot 1 time unit, you're going to see 1 radian. That's not enough. So you need to see how many radians? Uh, uh, 10 cycles? That sounds like uh, 60 radians. Mas or menos. And so you might guess that you want to take every, say, 32nd or 64th computational point and actually plot it as sequential pixels across the screen. So the, the, the compute delta, the, the, the number of time steps that you're solving between steps on the screen is going to be something like 32 or so. So you're going to need a state machine it's running the solver and then every 32 solve steps grabs a point and puts it out through the EBAB -E -B -A -B to put a point on the screen. Question? You, you have a, there's some people have puzzled looks on their faces. So there's time scaling you have to do and there's amplitude scaling as always. But hopefully, the, the steps up here will make it a little easier to, to figure out what to do. Once you, of course, once, once you actually want to use this code, after you substitute your own name, signal names in here uh, to manipulate the bus, then you have to compile in Quartus. Quartus Prime, you have to compile the Verilog. Once you've compiled the Verilog, then you can download it to the FPGA. Questions? How many people have the solver running on the FPGA? That's a, that's a floating maybe. We have like weird artifacts on the graph that we haven't debugged yet. So you've, you've got something, you've got a, you've got a waveform, but it's got glitches. Yeah, we have to, we're debugging it and making it Yeah, it sounds like a synchronization thing. Yeah, okay. 
Other people, where are you? It's hard to debug the solver on the FPGA without having the VGA hooked up. It can be done, but it's probably not worth spending the time on. You could put you could put X1 out of the parallel port and probe the bits with the oscilloscope. Oh, don't. Don't. But um, probably you, you just need to get the bus master working. Now you could do this in steps. For instance, you could wire up a bus master to the VGA and not hook up your solver, but just hook up a, a, a fixed value and see if you get a straight line out. Maybe make the, 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 the height of the, so you're plotting a line across the screen on the VGA because you've set the value of that on the switches. And now you can, by playing with the switches on the FPGA, you can move that line up and down. Once you can do that, you know that the VGA subsystem is working, the bus master is working, without having the solver there. So if you have three people in the group, one could be working on the EBA, EBAB, another one could be working on the state machine or the solver. Third person could be doing simulation and everybody can be flailing simultaneously, which is probably the optimum. This, this, is, this is a big lab. <clears throat> Do you want to see more example? By the way, I have my, so I, I wrote, I, I modified the, the video subsystem so that the HPS is wired through QSYS to SDRAM. So SDRAM is the bus slave. SDRAM is also connected to uh, a, a, a bus master that I wrote. So either one of these now can write, and SDRAM is then read out to the VGA interface. So either the HPS or the bus master can write SDRAM. The bus master is also wired, also wired to two port static RAM on chip, which is getting input from the video input codec. <clears throat> so all of the VGA information is coming out of SDRAM. The video codec is going only in here. The, the bus master can read this SRAM and write it back out to SDRAM to copy the input window into the output window. The HPS can simultaneously put graphics onto the screen. Got this all hooked up yesterday, turned it all on, and got a blizzard of noise. The sink is, uh, is some, I don't know what's wrong yet, but if I stop the program on the HPS, so it's not no longer writing to the, to the uh, VGA memory, the SDRAM, then the bus master can copy the SRAM from the video in to the video out, put it into a window on the screen. So this is the video in, Im Im embedded in the VGA screen, except that it only draws every other pixel. What in the? So ver there's vertical stripes. It looks like you're looking through a screen door. Clearly, I have an off by one error someplace. Haven't found it yet. It's what makes life worth living. So, <clears throat> but at least, at least I can see a distorted version of the video. It has the right aspect ratio. It's not flickering. You know, it's, it's synced up, yada, yada. As soon as I turn back on the HPS, this thing turns into horizontal stripes. So that's another problem I don't understand yet. But <clears throat> you don't have to worry about that because you're not writing, you're not using the HPS to write to the screen.
Any more questions on lab two? Anything else you want to see on lab two? Want to see what do you want to do? It's kind of a stupid question, but are we required to write C code on the HPS side, or just anything that'll write to memory, read and write to memory? Why do you need to read write memory? Or write to memory, or write to the bus? Sorry, write to the bus. To put in the dynamics. I mean, to put in the parameters. To put in the parameters. Yes, you're going to have to write a C program that that allows you to query the user through some sort of interactive loop, right? You're going to have some F, uh, scanf or fscanf. You're going to read the console keys. You're going to then format that as a fixed point number and put it on to a parallel port. So you're going to be writing through a parallel port to your solver, probably. Yeah, so you need to, so you'll need to uh, add another module on here which will be a parallel I.O. that is driven from the HPS bus, uh, uh, lightweight bus. So this is the lightweight bus because you can't type fast enough to use the heavyweight bus. Use the lightweight bus and then this will be exported to, to the, so you're going to export these signals then to your solver. <clears throat> it's just a matter of writing the lightweight bus address though, right? So we could, like, I'm asking like, I don't know, is it okay to use a different language, essentially? Different so language than what? MC. What do you want to use? I mean, I, I don't know. I don't know. Like, if we wanted to, I'm just asking. Sorry, never mind. <laughs> sure, yeah, I, I guess you can use Python. Don't expect any support. Okay. For instance, I don't know how Python handles a virtual to real translation. Mm -hmm. Does it? Okay, I don't know either. That's the key thing. If, if running is root, you could do a virtual to real translation, you could do this. On the other hand, there's C examples which do this. So, you know, it's how you spend your time. What else? So again, you can debug the bus master completely separately from the solver. There's no reason why you can't do both at the same time. So, let's start talking a little bit about lab three, just to warm up the brain. Unless you want to hear more about bus masters. Oh, oh yes. It turns out, I, I wanted to find out if there was some kind of zoom control or something that you could use to compress a QSYS layout down smaller so you could see it all at the same time or blow it up? And the answer is, maybe. And, and, the, and, the, and, the, and the reason is, kind of. The answer is kind of. And that is, it, the, the, the zoom function doesn't actually zoom the editable interface, but if you go to the view menu, it's view menu, right? View menu. The last thing on there is schematic. You pop the schematic open and it does a block diagram uh, interface that looks kind of sort of like the Vivando interface except it's not editable as far as we can tell so far. But at least it shows you how blocks are connected together and you can, you can see it in a more geometric fashion and find out and see the hierarchy of buses, for instance, and how they're wired together, and that could be useful. <clears throat> you could trace wires. The wires are named on the schematic. The modules are named. The buses, uh, could you get any information about the width of the bus or anything? I don't think so. I think it is in 
some other text file, but it's not obvious. Oh, and if you open the QSYS file, there's a dot QSYS file for each system. So the computer, the, the video in subsystem, the VGA out subsystem. If you just open QSYS with Notepad, there's the complete text layout which describes in text the diagram. So you could build your own editor if you were that kind of masochist. But, uh, but in particular, it's easy to, to fiddle with. It's easy to edit. There's no user interface there. You just hack in the QSYS directly. Now, more on bus masters? Questions? Well, let's, let's talk a little bit about Lab 3 just to, to warm up. For Lab 3, I'm going to ask you to solve a two-dimensional drum head. So this is to be interpreted as a, as a uh, orthogonal projection of a flat surface on the screen of the, of the board here. And what we're going to ask you to do is to solve the vertical motion of a set of nodes on this drum head. It's a square drum. You don't see many of these in a band, but, but it's slightly easier to decouple the modes, right? <clears throat> so, so we're going to ask you to solve the, 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 surface assuming that a sufficient model where we have to define what sufficient is here is that you have a mass which is the membrane mass connected to indiv through individual nodes by springs so there's four springs connecting this mass to the nodes on each side of it So you push down on one spot on, the, on this and the whole membrane deforms. And do you know what that equation is that solves that? A rubber sheet that's deformed? Laplace's equation. So, so the <clears throat> The shape of this mem membrane is in fact analytic. You know, if you know where the all the poles are on a on a surface on an analytic surface, you know the whole shape of the surface. Ring any bells from complex analysis? What we're going to do is ask for a time solution to this, which is time varying. So we're going to ask you mathematically to pluck this this surface by applying a Gaussian pulse to the center of it. So there will be a Gaussian distribution of energy across the surface. And then let this membrane go. And because it's spring-loaded, it'll spring back and go through equilibrium to the other side, spring back. And in fact, you'll get waves propagating across the membrane because the time-dependent solution of this is the two-dimensional wave equation. So, what you're going to be doing then is a finite difference, finite difference simulation in space and time. So time is going to be quantized. X and Y are both quantized. And I'm going to ask you to quantize appropriately so that you can solve this membrane at audio rates to make a drum sound. So by way of motivation, I, I, I linked up some of last year, some of the uh, sounds. And there's a bunch of technical stuff here which we'll go through, including I'm going to ask you to, to um, match the nodes of your drum with the analytical solution, which is what that top is for the MATLAB solution. But we can make sounds like this. 
Nice and loud, isn't it? Or, or, or ch a sort of chime-like. Or gong-like. Bell-like. So it's a fairly um, general kind of thing. There was a, a, a bunch of, of, of more or less imaginative uh, uh, examples on the web page. Th these guys uh, decided to, to, to name their sounds according to what it sounded like they were hitting with a stick. <laughs> and that is glass hit. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, so we, we uh, chicken can. I don't know what that means. Glass hit. Little bongo. And mini bell. All right. And then, of course, if you if you have infinite time, <laughs> and uh, that was one guy working alone. Um, and then Mary had a little lamb. And you can sound, some of these sound more drum-like than others. And part of the parameters that determine that is how big is the grid. If you have a grid of size 1, let's say that these are the boundaries and these are held at 0. Let's say these are all pegged at 0 amplitude. So you have a, a grid that's with one point that's going up and down. That is exactly a harmonic oscillator. And all you can get out of it is a sine wave. <clears throat> the larger the grid, the more modes of vibration are available. And to get anything that sounds anything like a drum, you have to have at least five harmonics. Sampling theorem says that that must be at least a 10 by 10 grid. So that you have two points on the grid in each direction per harmonic. In fact, it starts to sound pretty good around 20 by 20. And I'm going to make that the minimum for this year, is 20 by 20. <clears throat> the, so there's going to be a requirement for a 20 by 20 grid. And there's various kinds of symmetry you can invoke but what we're going to ask for is the real number of nodes that are simulated, not the symmetry expanded number of nodes. The uh, solver has to solve the 2D wave equation. And there has to be at least three different sound effects. So you, there's four buttons on the FPGA, four push buttons. At least three of them have to be mapped to different sounds, leaving one for reset. So you need to be able to make three different sounds. Now, what does different mean? Well, you could change the stiffness of this membrane, which changes the speed of sound on the membrane, and therefore changes the pitch. So you could change the pitch. You could also change the boundary conditions. Let's say that one edge is free to flap, while the other, well, well, let's say these two are free to flap, and these two are held down, so it's like a bent, uh, it's, some, it's a piece of paper with two edges hooked on and two edges free to flop up and down. You'll get a different sound than if all four edges are pinned. So you can change the stiffness of the membrane. You can change the <coughs> boundary conditions. And I'm asking you to do one last thing, which is a nonlinear wave equation. 
<clears throat> so there's got to be an option for modifying this membrane in, a, in the following way. If you really clobber a drum, wham, then if you listen to a real drum, the pitch will be higher at the start of the, of the after the impact than as the impact decays away. And the reason is that when you deform the drum really hard, it gets tighter. You've stretched it. And as you stretch it, the speed of sound goes up and the pitch gets higher. So I'm going to ask you to implement a nonlinear velocity dependent, or I'm sorry, uh, displacement dependent pitch shift. And do I have any examples of that? I don't know that I have any examples of that yet. I've simulated it. And there is a MATLAB code which shows you how the, the, the system should work, but I guess I haven't linked up any examples yet. It makes the, the system significantly more realistic. You, you're used to hearing that pitch shift, you just don't notice it really. So, <clears throat> and part of your grade will be determined by how many nodes you can solve in real time. And this will be, the grade will be scaled to whichever group does the most. Uh, last year, uh, most people were around 400 to 1,000 or two, except for one group that did 300,000. It was, it was such a large dynamic range, we had to take the log of the difference to describe, to figure out the point spread. The reason for the, the reason for the large dynamic range of results is how much time did people spend parallelizing the solver? Because the only way you can get real speed out of an FPGA which has a fairly slow clock rate, 50 megahertz, maybe 100 megahertz for this application, is to have lots of solvers running in parallel. There's enough, so there's enough hardware on this box to run 400 nodes completely in parallel. Since, since, hence the 20 by 20 cutoff. You can run 400 nodes completely in parallel and solve one time step, one acoustic time step in 10 machine cycles. So one-fifth of a microsecond. Well that's sort of a gross waste of resource because at 48 kilohertz that's what, uh, uh, <coughs> just slightly longer, 21 microseconds, 20.5 microseconds, something like that. So. So, you're wasting a huge amount of time, which suggests that there's a better way to parallelize it. You want to have lots of solvers, but you want each solver to solve a bunch of nodes. Uh-oh. Now, how many ways can you break down a square grid into subgrids to solve it? Well, it must, it's at least the, there's at least that many, as many, as many ways as you have nodes. And so, some parallel solvers are going to take too many multipliers. Some parallel solvers are going to take too much memory. Some parallel solvers are going to be really fast at computation, but have a cruddy dispatch time as you're handing out nodes to be solved. Uh, that the, 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 the dispatch of jobs becomes, becomes the rate limiting feature. So you're going to need to come up with a, a parallel algorithm to solve this grid as fast as possible. A 
again, the most regular thing to do is you build, you build the arithmetic necessary to solve one node and you duplicate it 400 times. And the left boundary of one becomes the right boundary of the other, and you just plug them together, blah, 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 and, you, and you've got it, right? And there's a, only a couple of things you have to worry about. One is, how do you get energy into this? Because that's a broadcast across all of the nodes to get energy in. And how do you get energy out <clears throat> because if you just sum up all those nodes, you have a gigantic add tree, which is going to be way slow. So in fact, playing around with MATLAB suggests that if you just take the amplitude of the center node or some node nearby it, and use that to drive the audio output, that that's pretty good. So you can avoid that gigantic add tree at the end, which is a parallel is a serial bottleneck, right? So I'll talk about uh, how people have have parallelized this in the past, and maybe I can get Tomid to talk about how he parallelized. He, he and Manesh were the ones that did three hundred thousand nodes last year on this board, by the way. So maybe I can get him to talk about how he parallelized it. But the goal here is to do what is called fine-grained parallelism or single instruction multiple data parallelism because every node is going to execute the same code at every instant. Every, every, every node is going to compute exactly the same set of adds and multiplies for every time step and the only thing that is different between them is the boundary conditions. So, so for calculating a node, the input is the positions in the last time step of its neighbors? The, y yes. The, so for computing a node, you need two sets of data because, because each, each node has two state variables. It has a velocity and a position, right? second order system. And a way of regularizing that to make it a little easier to solve is to say we're going to pretend that we're, we're just, we need to know two positions. The current position and the last position. And if we know the current position and the last position then by inference we know the velocity. So, so the goal is going to be to take the last, the last time step and the one before that and use those to project into the future. Okay. I'm going to give you a formula for this. I'm not just going to, you know, turn you loose crazy wild. We'll talk about finite different stuff and, and, and current condition. You can't, you can't have a wave propagate too fast on this grid because if it propagates faster than two grids per cycle, it aliases. So there's a maximum speed you can have on the grid as well as a minimum wavelength across the grid. It's really the same thing. <clears throat> For contrast, looking even further ahead, Lab 4 is going to be using, is going to be using a parallel system in which each node is not doing the same thing, but is rather calculating its own set of, of values based upon a instruction stream of its own. So it's going to be a multiple instruction, multiple data system. And here, the dominant, the do, what dominates the solution speed will be, and that's what you're going to be graded on solution speed, is how well you can distribute jobs to the processors, which is the peril, a serial bottleneck. So the next two labs is all about parallelism. 
at the hardware level. No, no nice inter-process communication, no multiple processors unless you build them. Now, the thing I don't understand very well because it's the first time we've had it available is what happens when you mix the HPS system with the FPGA? Is it better to solve on the FPGA, on the HPS, or both? All right, thanks. I'll see you in lab in a few minutes.